started now. Okay, so today is the seventh session of the Isogeny Club and also the last one of this uh, winter semester. And uh, Jonathan will tell us afterwards a bit more about how we will proceed with this. Um, and today we have Mark, who's going to talk about horizontal race walking using radical isogenies. You may have seen his, uh, his well, I think, practice talk last week at Asia Crypt already, but um, we have a bit more detail today. He's a PhD student, I think, shared between Leuven and Leiden. So Kai Leuven in Belgium and Leiden University in the Netherlands. And um, I'll take it away, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot. So yeah, I'm going to talk about this thing called radical isogenies which is a certain method that you can use to compute uh, long chains of isogenies of a small degree. So you can use this to speed up uh, certain isogeny-based schemes, uh, especially the ones that are based on computing long chains of isogenies. Uh, and nowadays we have a lot of functionalities in the isogeny world that use this. Um, so here's a list of examples, uh, but the main thing that we were thinking about when we were doing this work was uh, actually the key exchanges. So, and Seaside in particular. So Seaside uh, is currently, I think, one of the most promising uh, post-quantum key exchange protocols. Uh, the main people that people really like it is because the keys are comparatively small. So compared to the other post-quantum key exchanges, it has the smallest keys. But the main disadvantage is that it's relatively slow. So basically the idea of this radical isogeny business is that you want to make uh, computing chains of isogenies faster. So we want to make Seaside a little bit faster. Uh, okay, so for those of you that don't uh, know how this works, so Seaside is a group action based key exchange. And basically, all group action based key exchanges look the same. There's always some kind of set and some kind of group that acts on this set. Uh, for Seaside, the set is uh, the set of elliptic curves over a finite field, in particular, the super singular ones and Alice and Bob both have elements of a certain ideal class group that acts on these curves. So in case of Seaside, this is the ideal class group of the endomorphism ring of E0. Uh, so what they do is they act on this starting curve E0 and they uh, they then act on what they get from the other person. So the result the other person gets from this uh, from this action. And because the ideal class group is commutative, the result they get in the end is going to be the same. So that's then their shared secret. Uh, and this looks very nice, I'd say. Like theoretically, uh, group action based key exchanges are very simple but there is a bit of a gap between theory and practice because if you want to do this so if you want to do seaside then you need to uh, be able to compute this group action right so you need to know what these magical ideal classes do with elliptic curves and if you look at the seaside protocol then you don't really even see this class group action that much anymore. It's kind of like hidden under the under the hood. Uh, because Seaside looks a little bit like this. So this is what's called uh, an isogeny graph. So the uh, vertices of this graph are elliptic curves. And the edges are isogenies. So here the uh, blue, red, and green edges are 3, 5, and 7 isogenies. And what Alice does when she wants to, let's say, generate her public key is she starts at this starting curve, E0, and then she does a walk in the isogeny graph. So this walk is the thing that's going to correspond to this class group action. So first she does a couple of 
three isogenies, let's say. She ends up at some other curve. And then she does some five isogenies and then some seven isogenies, maybe some more isogenies for some other small prime degrees L. And then she ends up at some other elliptic curve and that's going to be her public key. And now the idea is that, okay, as long as she doesn't tell anyone how many isogenies of each degree she used, uh, it should be difficult to find the path that she got from the starting curve to her, her, uh, her public uh, key. So essentially, if you want to do C sites, then you need to be able to compute these walks, right? So you need to be able to compute chains of isogenies of small degree. And that's exactly what I said at the start. And this is what radical isogenies is about. So how do you do this? How do you compute a chain of, let's say, n isogenies? Uh, so this is a problem. So let's wait, say we're given already uh, one step of the isogeny walk. So we have already one isogeny of degree n, uh, which is cyclic always. So we say that P is some point on the curve and then cyclic isogeny is always of the form where you take the quotient by the group uh, generated by P. And then we want to find uh, a cyclic extension of this isogeny. In other words, we want to find some point P prime on E prime, again of order N, such that when you compose it with the original isogeny phi, uh, you get a cyclic extension. So now the question is, how do you find this point P prime, right? Uh, so one way to do it, and this is the original way that was proposed in the Seaside paper, is just to try random points. So you take some random points on E prime and you multiply by this cofactor over here. And you hope that uh, the point that you get works. So in the, first of all, it has to have order N. And also you hope that it doesn't, for example, generate the kernel of the dual isogeny. So that would be bad. If you generate the kernel of the dual isogeny, that would be like, walking back in the isogeny graph. That's not what you want. You always want to walk forwards. So that's why you want the cyclic extension. And this right here, this is the reason that C side is slow. So this multiplication uh, is expensive. Uh, and also this method is not super nice because it's non-deterministic. So there's a, there's a certain probability that this fails. And then you have to try again. And that's not nice for certain things like constant time implementations. So what are other ways that you can do this? Uh, one way is with something called modular polynomials, uh, which is actually also not so nice because it's, it's not faster uh, and uh, also non-deterministic in most cases. Uh, depending on the exact algorithm that you use. Or uh, you use this thing called n division polynomials. So n division polynomials are polynomials uh, that have as roots the coordinates of the n torsion points. So if you could write down the n division polynomial on E prime, then somewhere along its roots should be the coordinates of P prime. So this is something you can do. Um, but one problem, for example, if you want to do this over finite fields, is actually the same problem that I mentioned for the first method, the first alternative method, uh, namely that most fast root finding algorithms are non-deterministic. So they have some probabilistic elements. And also it turns out that this is not so fast. Like if you want to write down these polynomials, you want to compute the roots, it's not faster than just doing the random point thing. But uh, there is a way in which you can make this work. Uh, and that's essentially how you get to radical isogenies. 
And the idea is that instead of computing a route every time, you just come up with a formula for the route. So some formula uh, in terms of the wire stress coefficients of E that just always gives you the right route. Uh, okay, so how, how do you do that? I have an example for this. Uh, so this is how you get the radical five isogeny formulas. Uh, so our assumption was we had a, an elliptic curve E and we had this point P that gives you an isogeny to some other curve, right? And for five isogenies, it's gonna be a point of order five. And it turns out every curve with a point of order five can always be written in this very special form. And this is what's called the Tate normal form. Uh, so if you put this point at the origin and you do some more scaling, then you can always write it like this for some value of the parameter B. Uh, and this is called the Tate normal form parameter. Uh, and that's very nice because now we can do everything in terms of B. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to treat B as a variable and we're going to see what happens with this, uh, this point P prime in terms of B. So first you can write down uh, the equation for E prime. So just take the quotient by P. You get some formula. Uh, you can do this using Velus formula. Very explicit, very nice doesn't matter exactly what it is, but you can do it. And then you can write down the n division polynomial, or in this case, the five division polynomial on this curve, and you can compute its roots. Uh, and if you do that, then it turns out that uh, this thing uh, gives you the coordinates of this point P prime that we were looking for. So this is this point that cyclically extends the isogeny. Uh, so it's some expression, it's in terms of this parameter B, and it depends on the fifth root of B. And this fifth root right here, that is why we call it radical isogenies. So this is called a radical in mathematics. The nth root in general, that's, that's called a radical. Uh, okay, cool, uh, very nice. Uh, this already gives you something you can evaluate and practice, it gives you fast five isogenies. But if you really want to show off, then you can even do it a little bit better because if you put this thing in Tate normal form again, so if you put this pair E prime P prime in Tate normal form, so you translate this P prime to the origin, then you get the value of the new parameter B prime. And this is again in terms of this fifth root of B. And this is really nice because now you can just iterate this thing, right? So computing a chain of five isogenies is nothing different than just starting with the B and iterating this formula. And that's very fast. So this right here, this is the fastest way in which we know how to compute chains of five isogenies. Um, okay. So now the question is, uh, can you do this in general? Can you do this for any N? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can do it. Um, so you can prove that radical isogeny formulas always exist and they always depend uh, on the nth root of some of some some function of the Weierstrass coefficient of the starting curve. Uh, but it's not super easy to find them. So if you do this thing with the division polynomials, uh, then, so this was the method of the first radical isogeny paper, then you can only get up to degree 13. And that's already including a lot of smart tricks. So this is, a highly non-trivial thing. And the reason that it's non-trivial is because, um, well, first of all, these division polynomials, they get extremely large. And then uh, finding a root of them 
especially when there's like parameters like B involved, that gets extremely complicated. So computationally, that's just a thing that's, yeah, not really feasible. So we kind of need a new method, right? We need a new idea how to compute these formulas. And that's what we did. So we found, we found a new idea, luckily, otherwise we wouldn't have had a, a paper, I guess. Uh, so here's the problem again. So we had this, we had this cyclic uncertainty that we want to extend cyclically. So we want to find this point P prime, right? So what do we know about this point P prime? Uh, it has order N, it generates some isogeny, but it cannot generate the dual isogeny because that would be like walking back. So we want the point uh, P prime to map under the dual isogeny, not to the identity, but to some non-trivial multiple of P. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm going to assume that it's uh, exactly P. So that P prime exactly maps to P under the dual isogeny. And it turns out actually later that this is a this this is a good assumption. Um, so in that case, you can write p prime uh, as the image under phi of some nth root of p that I call q. Uh, this is also not super difficult to see. So okay, certainly p prime is the image of something. Uh, and then if you apply the dual isogeny to both sides, then this equation for lambda equals one essentially exactly tells you that Q has, uh, that N times Q is P. Okay, but this still gives you some freedom, right? Because there's multiple options for Q. So there's going to be multiple points P prime. In fact, all of the options for Q you can get by adding to Q an arbitrary N torsion point, right? So if you if you add to Q an N torsion point, then it doesn't change this equation. Um, but if you add multiples of P, then that's not going to change the value of P prime, right? Because phi was taking the quotient by P. So in fact, you can see that all of the options for P prime are given by this thing over here. So if we take some point R, that is independent of P. So another, another N torsion point that together with P generates the full N torsion. Then the options for P prime are exactly the images of Q plus some multiple of R. Okay, so there's N options for this point, this magical point P prime that we are looking for. And we just want to find one of them. If we have one of them, then we're happy then we know P prime and then we can do we can do our business. So now the question is how do you find this, right? So right now I haven't been talking about where this Q lives. I haven't been talking about fields. Uh, this is just abstract nonsense so far. So I'm gonna do everything again, but now I'm gonna keep track of the fields. Uh, I quickly check the chat, but it looks like this is not a question. It's about the discussion thread. Should I open that actually, if I want to see the questions or? No, we'll keep track of it. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna start with an elliptic curve over some field K. And I had this point of order N. And now this Q lives somewhere. I don't know exactly where it's over some field extension, uh, and it's an nth <clears throat> an nth root of p, right? Okay. So how do we find p prime? Uh, one way is by using Velu's formula. So we can find, uh, let's say, the x coordinate. Turns out computing the y coordinate is completely analogous. So I'm just going to focus on the x coordinate. Compute the x coordinate of p prime. Um, as some expression in terms of coordinates of things on E. Um, and actually, the second term, it doesn't really matter. So, Velu wrote this thing here uh, just to make his formulas a little bit nice. 
but this is just like a, a translation essentially of the the formula so this we always know what it is it doesn't matter you can even apply values formulas without this what we care about is this first thing because this involves this point q that we don't know yet mm. so um let's call it beta zero and we're gonna find try to find beta zero and we're also going to write down the betas corresponding to the other options for p prime right so we had these these other points that you got by adding two q's on multiples of r and there's also values of beta so there's also x coordinates associated to those uh and we want to find one of these right we want to find one of the one of the beta j's and now essentially what we're going to do is instead of finding one of them we're going to find all of them at once and it turns out that that's just as easy uh, as finding one of them so we're going to try to find the sequence of beta j's but first we're going to do a discrete Fourier transform of, of this sequence so we have some nth root of unity and we apply this thing this is called this is a linear transformation and this is called a discrete Fourier transform and we apply this to the sequence of betas and we get some other sequence of gammas and now you're probably thinking what the heck what is going on why why are you doing this Fourier transform? Uh, and the, the simple answer is that it turns out that it's easier to find these gammas than to find the betas. And essentially, once you have the gammas, then you're also happy because this is an invertible transformation. So then you can also find the betas. Uh, and then the difficult explanation is the thing I'm gonna do now uh which is the reason why why is it why why are these gamma somehow better than these betas mm. so uh first of all once we have the gammas then we can compute this beta zero thing right because we can invert the system and beta zero essentially is just the sum of the gammas okay you divide by n whatever and we're going to rewrite this a little bit like this uh why because of this so here's the the magic thing and this is what comes out when you do something called galois theory and if you know about galois theory then you can do this as well like you can prove this this lemma that i have right here you can do it yourself uh and the reason it works is essentially because this discrete Fourier transform like something with the zetas something with i don't know galois actions uh and what you prove right here is, well, first of all, that all of these coefficients that I wrote down here are elements of the base field K. And that this gamma one to the N is also an element of K. Okay, why is this nice? Well, if I define alpha to be gamma one, and I call these things coefficient CD, then well alpha to the n is in k so alpha is the nth root of some element of the base field and the coefficients are also in the base field so this what you have right here this is a radical isogeny formula this is exactly what we wanted because this is yeah it's an element of k alpha alpha is the nth root of something and right here you have the proof like this is it this is why radical isogeny formulas always exist uh okay cool uh there's more proofs uh, and so the original proof in the first paper was with something called date pairings uh, and that proof is a lot more elegant than than this thing uh but krein sent me an email before that maybe not everyone knows what date pairings are so that's why i thought okay maybe it's good to to give you a different proof uh okay but now the question is how do you find this because okay we have a proof we have this weird thing cd but how are we going to ever find the formula for this for the cd things right uh 
so that's the question. We want to find these coefficients. How do we do that? Uh, the idea is that we're going to do <coughs> uh, some CRT business. So we find formulas for the coefficients over many small finite fields. And then we're going to lift the formulas to characteristic zero by using the Chinese remainder theorem. Uh, okay, so now the question is, how do you find the formulas over finite fields, right? Over small finite fields. Uh, and for this, we have uh, some more tricks, actually. So, okay, this is what we want to do. First of all, what do I mean by a formula, right? I mean, what, what, what is a formula? Uh, well, it's kind of the same as what we saw before. So it turns out in general, uh, elliptic curves uh, with points of order n have a Tate normal form. So before I showed you the Tate normal form for n equals five, uh, for any n, there is a thing called the Tate normal form. Uh, and it depends on not one parameter, but two. So there's in general, there's two parameters, b and c. And these b and c things, they satisfy a relation that says that the point at the origin, so the point zero, zero, has order n. So this is some algebraic relation between b and c. And then the fancy way to say it is that the pair bc lies on the modular curve x1n. So what is this x1n? It's just a, some curve that parameterizes points, uh, this elliptic curves, together with uh, points of order n. OK, so now what is a formula? A formula is an expression for CD, so these coefficients, in terms of B and C, right? Just like we had before, we had formula for the point x0. So we had this thing. Wait, I can go back. Uh, yeah, so we had this thing that depended on the Tate normal form parameter B. And now we want something similar, but for B and C. Okay, cool. Uh, how do we do it? We do it by something called rational interpolation. And this is exactly the stupidest way in which you can come up with a formula for something. It's like when you have no clue what you should do, then you do this. Uh, so essentially you compute a lot of samples. So you compute a lot of curves where you know the value of B and C. And for all of these curves, you look, okay, what is the value of CD? And once you have enough samples, then you can deduce an expression by using linear algebra. This is, this is called rational in interpolation. Uh, so essentially the reason I wrote smallish finite fields here instead of just small finite fields is because you need the fields to be big enough for there to exist enough curves in the first place. Like you want enough samples to deduce a rational expression, right? Uh, okay. So when you have this idea, the rational interpolation idea, then you can already find more radical isogeny formulas. So if you just do this, if you just generate random curves and you do the rational interpolation thing, then you can get up to, at least that's what we got, maybe some smarter people with smarter computer skills can get more. We got up to n equals 17. So before we had n up to 13 with the division polynomial thing, uh, with this you can go, get up to n equals 17. Uh, which doesn't sound super impressive, right? I mean, what, it's like four, four formulas more. Uh, so if you want to go further, you need actually even more tricks. And essentially the trick that I'm gonna explain now is how to uh, generate these samples efficiently. Uh, and that's gonna get a little bit technical, so I do apologize uh, for everyone. Uh, please feel free to, I don't know, take a nap. Uh, you guys wanted an hour talk, so I'm gonna get into the details of what we were doing. 
so, okay. Uh, we want to generate the samples, right? And we want to do this over a finite field FP. So we want all the things on this technical slide over here uh, that I had before to be defined over FP. Because if, if it's not defined over FP, we cannot really we cannot really do anything with it. So, okay, what do we need? We need this point P. That one we kind of already have for free if we have an elliptic curve in take normal form, okay. Uh, we want this nth root of P. Okay, surely that's something non-trivial. Uh, we also want this other n torsion point independent of P. And we want some nth root of unity. So, okay, the last thing is easy. That's just a condition on the prime P. We can just uh, say that P should be, uh, at least we, should, we could say that n should divide P minus one then you always have nth roots of unity. Uh, and then for the first thing, let's just say that we want a curve with full n squared torsion. Surely that would be enough to guarantee the existence of all of these points Q, P, and R. Okay, so uh, now the question is how do you find these, these nice curves? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set P congruent to one mod n to the four. So surely that guarantees that n divides p minus one. So that's nice. We have we have n roots of unity. And then we're gonna look for curves of trace two. So this looks a bit weird. Trace two, maybe you haven't seen that before. Uh, but that essentially guarantees that n to the four uh, divides the number of points. Right, because the number of points is p plus one minus t, and we knew that p was one mod n to the four, so this guarantees that n to the four divides p minus one, which is the, the number of points. And that's almost the same as having full n squared torsion, right? I mean, uh, maybe it can go wrong, maybe you don't exactly have full n squared torsion, but you have like one point of order n to the four. But in any case, okay, small detail. In any case, if if you're lucky and you actually have full n squared torsion, then you have all of these things. And uh, so now the idea is, okay, we we generate a lot of curves like this. We compute all of the quantities on the technical slides. Uh, that's going to allow us to compute all of these CDs. And once we do that for enough curves then we can do the rational interpolation thing, right? So now the question is, how do you generate these curves? Uh, and that's actually the final trick that we need. And that's the trick that allowed us to go not up to n equals 17, but all the way up to n equals 37. Um, and that's actually, it's something everyone knows. Um, it's called the CM method. Uh, so the CM method, it's a way to, given a prime and a trace, to find an elliptic curve over FP with that trace. Uh, and there's like a small amendment to the CM method that also controls the torsion structure. So we can also make sure that this, uh, this guarantee over here that we have full n squared torsion is, uh, is satisfied. Okay, so for those of you that don't know how the CM method works, I have a small introduction. And I think this is kind of cool uh, because essentially this uh, idea is what leads, what led in the first place to Seaside. So this is something that's about elliptic curves over the complex numbers. Uh, and elliptic curves over the complex numbers are lattices. So uh, it turns out that there is something called an equivalence of categories, which basically means that elliptic curves of the complex numbers and lattices are the same thing. So for anyone that is doing lattice-based cryptography and says isogenies are stupid, you can tell them we have lattices too. Uh, so on the right-hand side, I have a lattice in the complex numbers, uh, which is spanned by one and some complex number tau. 
And we're going to say that a morphism of lattices is just a complex number that multiplies one lattice into the other. Uh, and this morphism thing, that's actually an isogeny. So in the, in the complex world, these are isogenies. Um, and then there's this thing called the modular J function, uh, which is some function on the complex upper half plane, which takes one of these taus uh, and gives you the well, it gives you the J invariant of the corresponding elliptic curve. And just as for elliptic curves, we know okay, two lattices are isomorphic if and only if the J invariants are the same. Uh, okay, now most of these lattices uh, don't have a lot of endomorphism. So if you if you look at the complex numbers that multiply a lattice into itself, most of the time this is just the integers, uh, except when tau satisfies a quadratic equation. So if tau satisfies a quadratic equation, then some multiple of tau is also in the endomorphism ring. So for some multiple of tau, if I multiply it by lattice, I, I still end up in the same thing. And in this case, we say that the lattice has complex multiplication. Uh, and then its endomorphism ring is some order inside of the uh, imaginary quadratic number field generated by tau. And once I have this, then I can define something called the Hilbert class polynomial. So the Hilbert class polynomial uh, is essentially the minimal polynomial of the J invariants of uh, a lattice that has complex multiplication. So it's the minimum. So if, if I take the Galois group of this field extension, so first of all, if I if I append to K the J invariant of such a tau, then I get a Galois extension. And it turns out that the Galois conjugates of this J of tau are exactly the J invariants of the other lattices that have the same endomorphism ring. In particular, the Hilbert class polynomial only depends actually on O. So not, not just on tau, but actually only on O, uh, which in turn only depends on the discriminant of tau. So that's why sometimes people also denote this thing by hd of x, where d is some discriminant. Uh, and there's a lot of cool things about the Hilbert class polynomial. Uh, one of the cool things is that it turns out that it has integer coefficients. And if you know a little bit about something called class field theory, it's a the mathematical thing, then you know that this field, kj of tau, it only, also only depends on O, and that's called the ring class field of O. Uh, and the degree of this Galois extension is always exactly the class number of O. Uh, okay, anyways, doesn't exactly matter. The real question is, why did I tell you all of this? What does this have to do with elliptic curves over finite fields, right? Because that's what we that's what we care about. We care about elliptic curves over finite fields, uh, and that's where the CM method comes in. So, this is a way to construct curves with a given number of points, or equivalently with a given trace. So, if I have over some finite field an elliptic curve, then uh, simply from the fact that uh, the Frobenius endomorphism is in the endomorphism ring, uh, it follows that the curve is special in the previous sense, so special in the sense that it has complex multiplication. So there's some element of the endomorphism ring that satisfies a quadratic equation. Uh, okay, and then from the fact that the Frobenius is in the anamorphism ring, uh, it follows that the discriminant of the Frobenius is some square multiple of the discriminant of the anamorphism ring, right? And the discriminant of the Frobenius, that's t squared minus 4q. So this thing is some square multiple of the discriminant of the anamorphism ring of the curve. Okay, how do you use this? 
Well, this gives rise to this thing called CI method. So this is a way given a Q and a T to find an elliptic curve over FQ with trace T. First, you solve this equation above here. So you look for some uh, discriminant for which there is a u for which this equation holds. So for which u squared times d is d squared minus 4q. And then you compute the Hilbert class polynomial of this discriminant. And you compute a root uh, over fq. And then you construct an elliptic curve that has this root as a j invariant. And turns out that this curve is always going to have trace, well, plus or minus t. So this equation forgets about the sign of t. Uh, so sometimes you have to output a twist. It's a kind of a technical thing. But in any case, you can use this to construct a curve with trace t. And furthermore, uh, it turns out you can control the L torsion just by looking at what the valuation of this u thing is. Uh, and that's, if you remember, that's what we wanted. We wanted some control over the n torsion of, uh, of certain curves at some point. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this constraint that we want the n torsion to split, or the n squared torsion in our case, is equivalent to demanding that this thing is maximal. So that phi n of u is as large as it can be. OK, so now, after this CM method thing, back to what we were doing. We were finding a, a method to compute radical SRGN formulas. So here's the algorithm. Here's the full thing that we did, which is what led to our uh, the new formulas that we found. So first we have these prime numbers uh, that we want to be one mod n to the four. That's not super difficult. I think we can do that. Uh, and then for each of these prime numbers, we're going to compute the roots of these Hilbert class polynomials. So for discriminant d that, set, that satisfy the equation for trace two with the additional constraint that n squared divides u. And that's going to be the thing that controls the n squared torsion to split. Uh, OK, then we're going to pick a model for this modular curve x1n that I was talking about. Uh, just think of this, uh, this equation that we had between b and c that said that the point at the origin had order n for the Tate normal form. So you can pick an arbitrary model, but yeah, just think about these parameters B and C that we had before. Uh, and then for each of the roots of the Hilbert class polynomial, we're gonna compute the points on the modular curve. So again, think of these as pairs B, C, for which the J invariant of the corresponding curve uh, has, well, is the right thing. So the thing that's, gives me a curve with nice properties, namely full n squared torsion over, over a nice field. OK. Uh, and then for each of these curves, if the trace in these is, indeed is plus 2 and not minus 2 by accident, we can compute these coefficients cd with this technical slide with all the q's and the r's and the zetas and whatever. Uh, and then for each of the d's, if you have enough samples, you can determine the function that corresponds to this on the modular curve by this rational interpolation thing, the stupidest thing you can do. Uh, and this, right now I wrote it like this because this works for arbitrary models. So it turns out in the paper, we didn't use this state normal form model with the B and the C, but we used some other parameters for the modular curve X1N that turned out to be more efficient. So this gives you a slightly more compact form for this uh, for this thing as a function on, of the parameters. Uh, OK, and once you do that for enough primes, so if this bound is large enough that you have over here, then you can determine the formulas over Q. And that is what you want. Those are the 
final radical isogeny, uh, isogeny formulas that you can apply for arbitrary uh, walks on, on curves over big finite fields. Okay, and this this is what allowed us to go up to degree thirty-seven for the for finding the formulas. Okay, cool. Uh, very technical, I know. So apologies, but I hope you uh, you got something out of it. Uh, there's two small things that I'd like to talk about still, which I think I'm obliged to do because they are part of the title of the paper. So we have horizontal race walking, uh, and there's two things, namely horizontal uh, and race walking that I haven't explained yet. So the race walking part is uh, has to do with finding formulas that are good. So right now I explained something that gives you a formula, but then there's nothing that guarantees you that this formula is nice, right? So what we did is we uh, rewrote the formulas a little bit so that they are faster to evaluate. Uh, in the first radical isogeny paper, we had this formula for radical eight isogenies. Uh, so as I told you before, okay, we used slightly different parameters than this B and C. So it turns out for eight isogenies, you have this parameter A. Uh, and we had this thing, which is not super nice. And we somehow managed to reduce it to this. So this is just an example. We, we rewrote the expression, we used a slightly different alpha, and we got something that's easier. And easier is better because then it's faster to evaluate in practice. And there's a lot of tricks on how to optimize rational expressions. I'm not going to get into that because that's more technical stuff. But yeah, I just wanted to show you like an example that we managed to make the formulas a bit shorter. Uh, and then the horizontal thing. So uh, before I showed you the isogeny graph for three, five, and seven isogenies. And there's a reason I took odd primes because the prime two, as we all know, it's the oddest of primes uh, because the isogeny graph looks different there. Uh, instead of just a circle, you have some more things that come out of it. And there is a word for these things. So we call in uh, in the seaside world, we call the things that go along the circle horizontal isogenies and the ones that come out vertical isogenies. And essentially, if you want to do radical isogenies, then you always want to do the horizontal ones because if you do a vertical one, then you cannot continue your isogeny walk. Uh, so essentially what this amounts to, if you if you look at the radical isogeny formula, uh, for two isogenies, this uh, requires commute, uh, computing the square root of something, right? Because for radical isogenies, we have the nth root of something. For two isogenies, we have the square root of something. And then one of the square roots is going to correspond with the horizontal isogeny, and the other square root is going to, going to correspond to a vertical isogeny. And essentially what you want is you want to compute the right square root. And we actually formulated the conjecture uh, for even n. So for even n, you have this problem with the vertical things that tells you which of the nth roots you should take. Uh, and turns out this is non-trivial. So this is a non-trivial conjecture. Uh, and we could prove it up to degree 14. So for even n up to 14, we know which nth root you should take. Uh, above that, we also know because we have the conjecture and it works in practice, but we haven't proved it. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is nice because it speeds up the computation by a factor of two. So now you know Otherwise, you would have to compute both square roots and see which one you need. Uh, okay, so here are some benchmarks. What did we manage to do? Uh, we managed to get an 
asymptotic speed up of a factor of four for change of two isogenies. So using the radical 16 isogenies, you can speed up long chains of two isogenies by a factor of four asymptotically. But in practice, uh, for prime fields of size 512 bits, uh, it turns out it's more like a factor of three. And this thing uh, you should think about more in terms of uh, like verifiable delay functions. So there's this verifiable delay function scheme that requires you to compute a long chain of two isogenies. And essentially you can do it three times as fast using, using radical isogenies. And then for the C side uh, parameters, so the, the thing we had in the back of our mind when we did this stuff, we got 12% over our previous radical isogeny implementation. So what this actually does in practice, I'm not completely sure because we didn't benchmark it against some state of the art thing. So I don't know, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, but in any case against our radical isogeny thing from the paper before we have, we have 12%. Okay, uh, I, think, uh, I think that's it. So thanks for your time and hopefully you have some questions. Thanks a lot, Mark. <clears throat> it was a great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can just scream out or write in the chat. Um, maybe I can start with a question. So uh, I just wondered, like in the in the algorithm you you summarized. Yeah. Uh, so what, what what's the yeah this thing. Uh, yes. What's the what's the bottleneck here? What what made like uh, over thirty seven infeasible? Uh, so it's I uh, it's sixth step. So this the rational interpolation part. Okay. So, uh, well, okay. So yeah, there's uh, almost a uh, okay, not really a tie. Um, in terms of time, it's almost the same. Uh, to compute the samples and then to do the interpolation thing. So for the samples, we had we we needed this trick, right? The TCM method, uh, because if you do that with random generation of curves, you're not gonna get anywhere. That's how that then you only can do up to n equals seventeen. Um, but this sixth thing is way way more memory intensive. So I think for n up to thirty seven. Uh, you need really large matrices because the expressions get really large, like they get a really large degree. So basically yeah, you have like, uh, I don't know, like 300 by 300 matrices, matrices over some large finite fields. And then we're talking about, I don't know, like one terabyte of, of RAM or something. So I was lucky that I had a computing cluster somewhere with with one terabyte of RAM. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have been able to to get there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and then if is another question. If so, if you have one for degree, well, here you have it until degree thirty-seven. But I guess the uh, the formula becomes very complex the higher the degree you go. Yep. So sort of is there a sort of complexity for the uh computation so for the for the formula that you get for the complexity of the formula that you get uh that you know so i don't know of like um if if there is some theoretical lower bound or something that tells you okay the formula needs to be at least this difficult somehow um I think that the degree is kind of like quadratic in N and maybe there's an explanation of this that I don't know. Um, in any case, you can expect it to grow because um, the gonality of X1N grows. So there's like a lower bound on the degree of the smallest map from X1N to the projective line and this, gives you a lower bound for the 
degree of the formula as a function on the curve. That doesn't necessarily say, okay, the degree in terms of the parameters you choose has to be large, but essentially it gives you, I don't know, some, some increase in complexity. Uh, I don't know, that's, that's the best I can do, but. Then we yeah. can, do you also get like, so I think N is 25 is still genus zero or something. And the other one is around it would be genus one. So like, do you get mm -hmm. better formulas if the genus of X1 is low? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, genus zero is the best you can do, but the the highest one with genus zero is 12. Oh, that's much better. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, what do you mean much better? So the, the, I mean the highest N for which X1 N has genus zero huh. is N equals 12. Yeah, okay, then, and then for one, you get, again, sort of better formulas, I guess, and then for two. Yeah, you know? so um, I'm, I'm not sure if it depends that, I haven't looked actually in if there's a correlation between the genus and the complexity. Uh, the thing is, the reason that it's much better for genus zero is because in genus zero, you can do everything with one parameter. So that's why for, uh, the radical eight isogeny formulas, I had only one parameter A. And for the radical five isogeny formulas, uh, at the start, I had only one parameter B. And that's very, that's very nice. Once you go to higher genus, you always need uh, at least two parameters. So that's the same for genus one, two, three, it doesn't matter. The advantage of lower genus is i guess that there's a relation between the genus and the gonality so the really the really the the more important thing is the gonality uh because the gonality um i don't know why i'm why i'm skipping the slides i don't have anything about gonality anywhere but um so the gonality gives you an upper bound for the degree in one of the coefficients um and the models that we use so the not the tate normal form ones but the, the the slightly smarter ones uh for those one of the two functions attains the gonality of the curve uh and this gonality thing if you want to know about what which models these are and if you want to read more about that it's a paper by Andrew Sutherland, where he, he, he computes these models. And if you want, I can actually look up which paper it is, because it's it's a really cool thing. And I, I think it's something you should definitely like know uh, if, you, uh, if you do stuff with, with like, proof. I guess, uh, wait, let me see. Yeah, it's called constructing elliptic curves over finite fields with prescribed torsion. So that's this. That's the paper. If you, if you want, check that out. Uh, I see. There's another question by Gustave. What's what is the complexity of this method for an isogeny of degree around two to the e? Uh, you mean? I think you mean the method of generating the formula or do you mean the method of computing the chain because e like we know the formulas up to 37 so e is not that we don't know them up to that large of an e uh oh, well any case uh, i i think an answer both questions. So for the computing chains of isogenies, so typically you want E to be large, uh, it's polynomial, of course, and it's a factor four times fa faster than what we had before. So that's an asymptotic complexity estimate. So it's actually the factor in, in front of the log B is, is four times smaller. And then the complexity for generating the formulas, I don't know exactly, because this depends 
on what we were talking about before. So this depends on what the degree of the expression is, and I don't know a lower or upper bound on the degree of these expressions. But for sure, it's it's like exponential. Yeah. Probably also, yeah, most but also exponential in two to the e actually. So if uh, if there's any last Sorry. question, I have one last question, I think. Um, namely, so another place where we would would be very nice to compute compute a chain of two assertions very quickly would be ski sign in verification. Have you checked if you could sort of if there if there's com ideas are compatible or is that easily ruled out? Um. So. I didn't think a lot about ski sign because I thought, okay, uh, this is the stuff with the quaternions and the ideals, and it doesn't really look like you can apply this here. Uh, so I would have to check that. But um, so you're saying for the verification, yeah, what, what exactly do you want to do there? You want to compute a long chain of two isogenies? I, I think they but... computed two to the thousand isogeny, essentially. Okay, but just a random one or? No, so the, the, the signature is creating the specific isogeny. And then the, the signature, the verification is actually performing it and seeing that it works, I guess. But then if you could okay. formulate it in some sense, uh, that would quite speed it up quite a bit, I guess. Uh -huh. That is factor three, maybe, that you described. But the question is, so I don't know, like in my head, ski sign is kind of more in the world of SIDH because it's like curves over FP squared. And like for SIDH, you are already given a large torsion subgroup. And there you don't need to do this horizontal stuff because you already know a large two torsion points. You can just take the quotient with this and that's like you, do, you already have the, the large points over your base fields. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure, I don't know by heart what the situation in ski sign is, but if you already have a large two to the k torsion point, then uh, I don't think this helps you a lot. Uh, okay, so yeah, they do, they, you pick the prime in such a way that you have this yeah. two to the k torsion relatively big. Mm -hmm. So do, it won't speed up if you have a large. Two no, to because the then, and then it's just faster to to compute this point, this two to the k torsion point over fp squared. That then you you can do that in like at once, and then it's fine if you do the random point generation thing, because you only have to do it once. Yeah, here it might be actually an interesting trade trade off maybe. But okay, but uh, uh, I'll look into it. Actually, it's it's an interesting idea. It would be cool. I like speed sign so. Would be nice if we can. Yeah. I think we have one last question in the chat still by Gustav, which is on uh, what a prime is in the last formula. Yeah, so that's the parameter. So I used a as a parameter uh, instead of this b and c thing. So that's the a corresponding to e prime. So it's the parameter of the new curve. So this is a similar formula to what we saw before for radical five isogenies where you expressed B prime in terms of B. And now we express A prime in terms of A. But that's nothing to do with a Montgomery. Uh... Uh, no, 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 this is a different A, yeah. Just some, because X18 has genus zero, it's a, per, a parameter that's, uh, for for x one eight. Check. Okay. Um, if there's no more question, then yeah, thanks, uh, Mark, again. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. So, uh, and this was also the last talk for this semester. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it was the last talk of this semester, but uh, luckily, no need to despair because we're. Uh, planning on starting up again sometime uh, next year.
Um, before that, we hope that you can all, or it would be very nice with some some feedback uh, on like what topics you'd like to hear about next year. Maybe how like the time form frame is if every other week is too much or too rarely or yeah you can just uh, email email uh, uh, I saw at Gmail or yeah the 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 email address that's at the website anyway uh, and yeah please just give some uh, some feedback if you have something to comment on and uh, we'll be back sometime next year probably not January but. <laughs> after that um yeah and finally Klein also has uh, one one last thing to mention before we say happy christmas <laughs> yeah, we mentioned one uh last surprise which is that if you are going to eurocrypt this year and you may have already seen this on our website that we are hosting a affiliated event at eurocrypt um which will be a sort of a brainstorm session so we hope to collect your best ideas, and we'll discuss these and present these in the morning. Uh, and then in uh, several groups, we'll work on uh, specific ideas that you want to work on in the afternoon. Um, so if you're going to Eurocrypt, you'll see it in the registration for Eurocrypt itself that you can click on us on the Asogeny Club as an affiliated event. And we hope to see many of you there. Ooh, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thanks. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um...